The Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. Hello, and welcome to the Paul Leslie Hour. Thank you for tuning in. Before we get into the interview, I would be honored if you would consider going to thepaulleslie.com and clicking support the show. There are quite a number of things I want to accomplish with the Paul Leslie Hour, and you can help me get more of these interviews out there to the masses. It only takes a moment, and it makes a world of difference. Last but not least, tell someone about the Paul Leslie Hour. Let them know in whatever way you can. And now, let's get into the interview. Hello. Hi, is this Ruta Lee? Yes, it is. Hey, this is Paul Leslie. How are you? Hello, Paul Leslie. How nice to be chatting with you today. It is great to have you back. (laughs) Well, I am delighted. Thank you so much. I'm so excited. I decided I'm doing this interview standing up. <laughs> well, I'm standing up at the moment, but I'm now going to put my my little ass down. <laughs> you beat the record last time. It was one minute, and we got to say the A S S word, and now we're we're we, we're, we're beating that. <laughs> well, well, listen, Paul. Consider it kissed, like I say in the book title. <laughs> That's right, folks. She's back. Last time, we got a lot of mail on this guest. Ruta Lee, you've seen her on the screen, acting, dancing, lighting up the screen. She's a Hollywood star. You've seen her in Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, Witness for the Prosecution, one of my favorites, Funny Face, more than 2,000 appearances on television. And now you can see her, her words, that is, on the page. Consider your ass kissed her memoirs. It's so great to have Ruta Lee back on the Paul Leslie Hour. Paul, I'm so delighted that you're sharing your wonderful audience with me. How's the weather where you are? I can't complain. It's uh it it can be very hot down here, but it's nice and breezy and how about where you are? Well, it's a little breezy today as well and cooler than expected. Uh, I'm in Palm Springs, California right now, where I'm blessed to have a, a wonderful little house that I've had for a long time. And I must say, when I have the chance, that now that we have added to my list as an actress, a dancer, a singer, uh, a salesperson, a speech maker, uh, a philanthropist, we're adding author. And I've got to tell you, Paul, I really admire anybody who can sit down and do this for a living year after year. (laughs) I find it to be one of the most difficult jobs I've ever had to do, and especially editing, because you have so much to say and yet so little space to do it in. And in so many cases, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, you know. And boy, that's tough. So I really admire great authors. I have to say, I mean, writing is, as you say, a very difficult thing to do. But I'm sure there's a a tremendous sense of satisfaction. You have the book in hand. There's people reading it. How does it feel to finally realize this authorship of this book? Well, it's, it's a very rewarding feeling. On the other hand, I, as I read through it and scan through it, I go, oh my lord, I should have talked about that. I didn't mention so and so. I, but you know what I did do that I think is the smartest thing? I put a disclaimer in the book. I said, if you don't find yourself, even though you're very important in my life, if you don't find yourself on the pages of this, blame the editor. Blame <laughs> the publisher. <laughs> And that way I figure I'm not making enemies. Is there anything you learned about yourself writing this book? Yes. Something I should have known at the beginning, and that is how little patience I have with myself. I want everything done yesterday. And the the process 
of sending material back and forth to the editor for editing, you know, is a very painful one. And even though the book is now done, I haven't seen the hardback version, but the paperback version, I've already found like 10 errors. Mm. I guess it happens. I don't know that I've really ever noticed that when I'm reading other authors. I don't know that I sit there and say, oh, that's misspelled or the punctuation is wrong or what does this mean because they've garbled up one line with another, you know, which can happen. But I've, I spotted it in mine. So now I'm, I'm realizing that I um, am perhaps a little too picky and I've just got to kind of bite my tongue and say, you know what? It got printed. It's out there. I hope people are enjoying it. I'm hearing awfully good reviews. So I hope it stays that way. And then to find out that I was number two on the new issues for what's the big seller of, of, of oh my God, I suddenly lost my, my train of thought and my word. Amazon, Amazon. Right. Simple word, A. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so proud of that, you know, for a newbie, for a first-time person. Wow, I'm so excited. So you say you're, you're hearing good things. What, what have people been saying about this book, Consider Your Ass Kissed? What I'm hearing mostly is that people have kind of universally have said, it's like sitting down with you and having a drink and talking. <laughs> well, that is a great compliment. Absolutely. The the personal kind of feeling, the way I wrote it, and, and well, I did sort of talk it. I didn't sit and type it. I, I retyped things, but mostly I talked it, and my friend Barry Wayne in Texas came out and listened to me, and, and he took it down, transcribed it, and typed it, and I thought, that's the hard job, the, the doing all of that. So I've got, I now I think... Paul, that I've got more books in me. I really, I dedicated a chapter to my darling grandmother, and I think that that section of the call to Khrushchev, of my mother, my grandmother being deported to Siberia for an, a, no crime of any kind, but just the mass deportations they were doing, and to think of what she lived through in losing children and losing a husband. Legs were frozen on the cattle car and he died, gangrene set in. You know, it's an unbelievable story and I can't give it the kind of honor that it deserves that that woman lived through and um, the patience of my mother trying to find her and the help through the Red Cross of finding her and, and the family and what they survived under the red tide of communism is is unbelievable, and I think it has to be shared more fully because I'm so scared that so many of our young people who have been blessed without any kind of famine or war in America have not the vaguest idea of what the onslaught of communism could be to us. Well spoken, well spoken. Could you tell us a little more about your grandmother? What was her name? Her name was Ludwige, I, and I keep thinking, the only thing I can think of is uh, uh, go uh, uh, tell it on the mountain and go tell Aunt Ludy. Do you remember anything, those lyrics from oh, some yeah. kind of Americana song? I can't remember what it is even. And so her name was Ludwige Kamandulis. Come on, I've heard it shortened in, in, uh, in America when I've come across that name. But... Uh, she never got to school at all. In those days, schooling wasn't available to everybody, and they were farm folk and uh, surviving and uh, tilling the soil and milking the cow or the goat or whatever you had was far more important to your daily life than getting to school. So she never learned to read and write. And any messages that we got from her had to be written by one of her children, there, there by my aunts. You know, when I got permission from the Soviet authorities, well, that was basically thanks to Mr. Khrushchev, I was able, after my struggle to get to Lithuania, to bring her home to the United States. And Paul, 
this little old lady, 95 years old, more or less, we never really did know how old she was, came down the steps of the plane. We didn't have jetways then. And she dropped to her knees on the tarmac and kissed the ground and said, Hello, America. And she thanked God. Wow. And I am brought to tears every time I think of that moment. It was so beautifully stated, so beautifully done by someone who had longed to come to America all of her life. And finally she was here. And she lived here in my home for two years, two months, and two days. And amazingly enough, she had been invited because The Tonight Show followed it like the perils of Pauline, you know. My adventure of trying to get my grandmother out of the Soviet Union and first Siberia, then Lithuania. And I was doing The Tonight Show in New York when the producer, God bless him, came in and said, Ruta, I have dreadful news for you, honey. I don't know if you're going to be able to do the show. And he said, your your little grandmother has died. And I I said, of course, I'll do the show. This means so much. So many Americans in this world prayed for her with me and sent her little notes and gifts when I brought her to America. And now those same wonderful people will be able to say goodbye to her on The Tonight Show where she visited with Johnny. So it was a, a beautiful, beautiful finale and um, one that I'm grateful to John and The Tonight Show, and I'm grateful to all Americans who kept her in their prayers and kept me in their prayers because I needed them to get through all that stuff. Well, Ruta Lee, uh, thank you so much for sharing these stories. Thank you for being with us today. And as I said at the top, the last time you were on, we got so much mail from people especially men, but (laughs) we got a lot of mail from people. And I feel when I'm talking to you, even though I'm standing up, as I said, I don't feel there's a microphone in between us. I feel like we're sitting on a couch, as you said, having a beverage. Well, my dear, I (laughs) hope that you will kindly get your darling ass <laughs> out to California and literally put it on my couch in the bar or the living room or wherever and let's share a glass of wine or tin and swap <laughs> stories and you can tell me about your wonderful experiences because radio is a real key to the heart and soul of people I feel. I feel that radio has brought America together and keeps it together in many ways. Wow, that's that's very well put, and I have to concur. There is a, something very, very magic about the the wonder of radio and of of audio. You know, since we're talking about ass kissing, <laughs> I love that I get to say that today. <laughs> Has there been a best compliment that you've ever received? Wow, several. When it came to looks. It came from Ava Gabor, my darling friend, and I write about this in the book. She said, darling, Ruta, you're beautiful, you're wonderful, you're charming, you're delightful, you're absolutely gorgeous and wonderful. You look exactly like me. (laughs) And I thought that was pretty good. Then, of course, when it came to work-wise, Wonderful Meredith Wilson, who wrote The Music Man, who wrote The Unsinkable Molly Brown, was in the audience when the first time I played Molly Brown in at Casa Manana in Fort Worth, Texas, my favorite theater. And he put in print that I was the best of all of his Mollies and that if I had played it on stage in New York, it would still be running. And I, I thought that was the greatest compliment. Then an altogether highlight for me in the theater was when I was returned after a a year or two absence from my favorite theater, Casa Manana in Fort Worth, and I was doing Hello, Dolly. And as I came down the stairs of the Harmonia Gardens in the second act, singing, Hello, Harry, well, hello, Louie, it's so nice to be back home where I belong. 
the entire audience stood up after my words, nice to be back home where I belong, and applauded for something like three to five minutes. And the conductor knew we couldn't go on. He put down the baton. I, of course, welled up into tears and thought, oh, hell, my mascara is going to (laughs) run. And it was the most thrilling moment and I think the greatest compliment you could ever receive. To have a, a standing ovation at the end of a show was something, yes, because the entire company had worked hard and deserved it. But to be welcomed home to a town that adopted me and that I took as home, wow, what a gift from God. So I shared three very precious moments with you that I write about in the book, and uh, and I hope people will read and enjoy. You know, the last time you were on, we mentioned a little bit about Frank Sinatra, but I'm hoping you can tell us about a film that you were in, a lot of people, I'm sure, out there have seen this film, and you want to talk about a, a heavyweight cast. I'm talking about Sergeant's Three. Yes. Sergeant Three, unfortunately, didn't get the run that most big movies do on television because it was in litigation for years and years and years, having to do with the percentages, if I get the story right, I'm not sure, that were owed to Sammy Davis Jr. and to Peter Lawford. And they were in debt, tax-wise. And uh, so, therefore, the movie was held up and it did not run. I don't know how or why, maybe because they couldn't figure out who who was owed what. But now, thank God, it does run on occasion. But, oh, God, Paul, when you talk about the cast, to work with Frank... Sammy Davis, Peter Lawford, Dean Martin, Joey Bishop, the Crosby boys, this incredible cast of of comics, stand-up comics that had either opened with Frank or or played in the same saloons in, in Vegas. It was one big, huge laugh after another. It was very, very difficult not to pee one's pants laughing because the guys had such a good time. Oh, they worked hard when they were working, but between takes, there was nothing but pranks being played on each other, games being played, guns being shot, uh, just having one hell of a good time. And I don't think, because I was young and stupid, I don't think I ever realized how really blessed I was. To be taken to the location, Uh, first of all, we were all billeted in Kanab, Utah, where, by the way, you know, I have three stars. I have one on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I have one on the Palm Springs Walk of Fame. And I have one in front of our building, the uh, Thalians Mental Health Center, which is no longer called Mental Health. Uh, But you'll read about that in the book. I have a star there in front of the hospital. But in Kanab, Utah, they don't do stars for their their movie uh, people. They do hitching posts. Isn't that <laughs> fabulous? Interesting. So I have a hitching post with my plaque on it in Kanab, Utah. That's a picture of that's in the book, too, which is kind of fun. But, you know, the the I don't know how our director ever got everybody together to do what they were supposed to do and to get the, the, the film out in time. But Frank had a fleet of planes and he had a helicopter to take himself and, and the principals out to the location, which was against some gorgeous, gorgeous mountains. Uh, oh, God, Kanab is beautiful. Not just Kanab, all of Utah is absolutely spectacular. I think God had a hell of a good time painting the mountains, you know, when he, with a broad stroke because of the most gorgeous colors and, and beautiful scenery, which, of course, was captured in a lot of Western movies. That's why Kanab is called Little Hollywood. But to go to work in a helicopter and to fly to Vegas to see each actor as they had their show playing at the Sands. Wow. I thought all of life was going to be like that. Not quite, Paul. Not quite. (laughs) Nothing ever really lived up to that, no matter how wonderful it was. 
We're joined by Ruta Lee. We're talking about her new book, Consider Your Ass Kissed. And something that is evident to me in this interview and the last time, you have a great sense of humor. I'm sure that that shows through in the book, too. But I remember talking to you last time about how important humor is in this life of ours. But who would you say of all the fascinating people you've met, who has made you laugh the most? Wow, that that's kind of tough because thank God everybody was able to 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 make me laugh, and and most people that I loved in the business were were great pranksters, not necessarily stand up comics, but just wonderfully funny people to work with, you know. Well, let's see who made me laugh the most. Well, believe it or not. Of course, it was the entire mob on Sergeant 3 that made me laugh. Sammy Davis was brilliantly funny. Everything he did, and you know who was innately, I think, one of the funniest human beings in the world, was Dean Martin. (laughs) I don't think anybody realized how very, very funny he was. I'll tell you somebody else that was very funny and nobody realized was. I mean, in the general public because he was always kind of serious on uh, Jeopardy, but that was Alex Trebek, my very dear friend. Ah. Wildly funny. And I write about that in the book. He had a great sense of humor, not as a joke or storyteller, but as a throw-in-a-punchline kind of funny. Add to whatever conversation was going on, Wonderful little jabs of spice, you know, that were just great. He was wonderfully funny. And I'll tell you who else was wonderfully funny, and the whole gang was very funny. And and that was Hogan's Heroes, uh, Bob, help me with his name. (laughs) Who was the star of Hogan's Heroes? All of a sudden, I'm not doing names today. My brain went blank, too. Um... (laughs) I I think your audience will know. Oh, Bob Crane. Bob Crane, good God, how could I forget that simple name? (laughs) He had been a disc jockey, and so he had a great sense of palaver and timing and was very, very funny. But then so was everybody else on that show. And Lord, we laughed hard. But Bob Crane was kind of the leader of the jokes and, and and the craziness. Gosh, it was, you know, who else? I just totally adored that made me laugh all the time, whether it was talking just like we are today now or whether she was on stage, and that was the wonderful Phyllis Diller. Ah, Phyllis Diller. Wow. What a doll. Joanne Worley makes me laugh all the time. She's one of my good friends. And and Ruth Buzzy makes me laugh all the time. I don't get to see her as much now because she lives beautifully with her darling husband, Kent Perkins in in Texas. They have a wonderful ranch that looks like Tara. It's wonderful. I love to go go out there and stay with them. It's very special. Well, I think it's it's worth noting that Thalia was the Greek goddess, and one of her characteristics was that she loved humor. So can you tell the listeners out there about the Thalians? Oh, I'd be happy to. She was the the Greek goddess, of course, a muse and and the goddess of comedy. And she also collected stray lambs, which seemed appropriate uh, name for a group of people, young Hollywood people that really got very tired of being called hard smoking, pot smoking, hard drinking, hard sex minded idiots that had nothing to contribute to society. And they said, you know, we get together and we drink and and carry on and sing around the piano and have uh, dinners. Why don't we put something together and invite people, sell tickets, and we'll raise money for a charity? And they sent out Jane Mansfield to find a good charity. And Mamie Van Dorn, too, the two of them. The two ladies with size 48B bras, right? (laughs) And uh, it seemed like the appropriate thing to do. And they came back to the meeting and in typical Hollywood style said, well, all the good diseases have been taken. And uh, so they found 
a doctor that dealt with emotionally disturbed children, and he described that child as a rotting apple in a barrel that could affect the entire barrel and the entire community if not taken care of. So the Thalians were formed, and we supported mentally and emotionally disturbed children. In 18 years, we raised a lot of money, and we built the Thalians Mental Health Center, which was the first building that went in at the Cedars-Sinai Complex in Los Angeles. Huge. First building. And we now changed from just children, and we went from pediatric to geriatric service, care, and research. And then 55 years later, we after we'd raised millions and millions and millions of dollars through our shows that we did every year, honoring somebody wonderful in the industry that not only dazzled us on the screen or on the stage with their performances, but dazzled with their humanitarian performances as well. And we raised millions of dollars and we decided to switch our focus from pediatric to geriatric and focus on the plight of the returning veterans. These beautiful young people that were willing to put their lives on the line for us anywhere in the world that they were needed and yet would come back maimed and injured and fall through the cracks. And especially when it came to mental health, because that's always been the hidden disease. Nobody ever wanted to talk about it. And Hollywood shone a Hollywood Klieg light, a spotlight on that dark abyss that is known as mental illness. And hopefully we were bringing it into the light of healing. And we felt that we could do that for our veterans. So we joined Operation Mend at UCLA. Operation Mend deals with healing the broken and fractured bodies of our returning young men and women. And we Thalians concentrate on healing the fractured mind and spirit of these beautiful young people. And so I beg any of your listeners, if they have a dollar or two that they can spare, to please, please look up the Thalians, T-H-A-L-I-A-N-S dot org, and you'll read all about us and you'll get messages from our beloved founder, Debbie, from me as now chairman of the board emeritus because I've stepped down, made room for somebody else, and and send us whether it's two dollars, five dollars, five hundred thousand dollars. It will go to a very good cause to helping our American heroes in their plight and helping their families as well. And I thank you in advance for anything you can do. Well, Ruta Lee. Thank you so much for joining us here. And everybody out there, check out the book. It's Consider Your Ass Kissed. It's out now. You can get it on Amazon.com. And also, everybody, visit RudaLee.com. For anyone who's read the book or is planning on reading the book, or just anyone who's tuned in, is there anything you would say in closing to our audience just, I would say, please don't take insult with consider your ass kissed. I mean it from the bottom of my very full and grateful heart. It's the greatest compliment that I felt that I could pay to anybody that was generous to me and Debbie Reynolds and, and our Thalians. And I continue to say from the bottom of my heart, with all the blessings that go with it, consider your darling asses kissed. <laughs> and so go get the book and read about it. And I love you, Paul. Thank you for sharing your wonderful audience with me. Americans are the most generous people on the face of this earth, and you've got them as listeners. And I thank you for sharing them with me. Thank you. And I can say now on behalf of all my listeners, because they wrote into me, we love you, Ruta Lee. Thank you so much for being here. God bless you and God bless all of America. God bless. Until next time.
Goodbye.